What does Sweden, Christmas, and Star Wars all have in common? It's all part of our co-host Brian Kane's illustrious story on today's episode of Spirit Inspire, starting right now. Broadcasting from the Cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville, Kentucky, this is Spirit and Spire. And now, here is your host. Hello, everyone. I'm John Soule. Welcome to Spirit and Spire. My co-hosts, Eric Huff, Brian Kane, and Isaac Fox. Today's episode, we're going to be breaking open the story of Brian Kane. He has a lot in his past, his present, and his future, and we're looking forward to hearing a lot of what is in, uh, he has to share with us. So, welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. That was a very com- confident uh, declaration of how much I have in my future. Yeah, um, I was more concerned about how much you have in yeah. your past. <laughs> yeah, it did sound okay. It did, God it was, willing, but it was in appropriate. His it was appropriately <laughs> nefarious, uh, uh, as you will see as my story unfolds. Uh, That's all right. Well, with that being said, regardless of any of the nefarious. <laughs> Uh, or good things. Let's uh, let's just hear a little bit about where you've come from uh, before we get into the where you're heading. Sure. Like that. Okay. So, right uh, well, thank you uh, for for uh, for having me. I suppose on on my own show uh, <laughs> that I've helped you guys. Build. This is fun. Um, just for a little bit of context for now, and then maybe we can flash back. But uh, my name's Brian. Um, I'm married. I've got four kids. And um, maybe I'll get a little bit more into those details uh, as we go forward. But I, um, I work as a director of mission advancement uh, for Holy Angels Academy, which is a little independent Catholic school here in Louisville. Uh, but my journey to uh, a dad and a husband and working for the Catholic Church is a, is a a tale full of twists and turns. And if you had asked me 10 years ago, uh, you know, what I thought I would be doing uh, or what kind of family I might have or anything like that, it would definitely not, not be probably enough. contain any of those things, probably not including Louisville, Kentucky or knowing you guys. So, so we wouldn't even be friends? Oh, I mean, so it's hard to ask what if in, in uh, the life of a Christian, sure. but, um, but probably not. Um, yeah, it's only by grace I'm able to bear you guys uh, for any of my uh, no. <laughs> This guy. We're, Why'd we invite him? <laughs> we're working on your sanctity, Brian. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, that's we, what I tell we, my wife. We try to be the little crosses you bear. <laughs> that's <but> yeah. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I tell my wife that uh, she has the best husband because I'm the heaviest cross to carry <laughs> and most likely to get to heaven should she be able to. Yeah, uh, she's going to do no time in yeah, purgatory. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. she's a saint. And that's, that's, right. the, that's, the, that's the husband uh, you want as a saint. So, um, But yeah, so let's, let's go back. So um, I was uh, born in Athens, Ohio, to go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, my dad was in medical school at the time at Ohio University, and um, I was raised Catholic. I, I say I was raised, um, you know, sort of faithfully, yet also somewhat nominally Catholic. Um, we went to Mass every Sunday, um, but we didn't necessarily um, talk much about the faith at home or um, or pray much as a family uh, outside of Mass. That said, my parents were very faithful, um, and we, we did go to Mass every Sunday, even when we were on vacation, which I've since learned you know, is, is definitely a grace and not something that every family that I would sort of put in the same category um, as mine growing up uh, does. So I'm very thankful to my parents for that commitment to Sunday Mass and, um, and anyway, so, uh, so raised Catholic. Um, I, I enjoyed the faith growing up. I, I don't think I was really well catechized. You know, I did sort of um, religious education on the weekends and that sort of thing. Uh, but I do remember it being, you know, sort of uh, f- fluffy, if you will, or, um, you know, lots of coloring books, uh, you know. Um, I don't remember really connecting in an intellectual way other than hearing the stories. And, um, huh. But uh, but then you know I do I do my confirmation stands out to me I, I chose Saint Francis as my patron saint I remember Saint Francis Xavier of Assisi of Assisi. Saint Francis so did, of Assisi. so did I I did not realize All that right. yeah. Saint Francis of Assisi yeah. look at that 
cool. So I think we're all Franciscans then. I think you're maybe the only one I didn't know. So you got Maximilian Kolbe, St. Anthony, and two uh, yeah. Francis's in the middle. Wow. Look at that. It's funny because I'm more like Dominican. I know, like I know. And there's always going to be this eternal <laughs> tension between yeah. Franciscans and Dominicans. Look at it. And John's even dressed like a Dominican. What? <laughs> she, you are. He is, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I today can't. is the, the feast of St. Dominic. That's it true. Is. true. It is. It is. Oh, we just dated the recording. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, this is coming to you live, so it's whatever, it's whatever day yeah. you're watching it. That's right. That's Every right. day is the Feast of St. Dominic around here. <laughs> yeah. so anyway. My, my spiritual director is is a Dominican, so I definitely feel a, 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 a bar, bipartite, can you say that? Uh, allegiance to the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Well, and um, you know, St. Dominic and St. Francis in heaven are totally fine with each other. And is cool, that so. true? They're not still having uh, I hope sort not. of brotherly rivalries. Well, um, maybe, maybe that's okay. <laughs> on, the base, on the heavenly baseball field. That's yes. right, on the uh, baseball there's, field. <laughs> <laughs> there's the, the Franciscan softball team and the and the Dominican softball team. Ridiculous. Um, anyway, you were confirmed. <laughs> yes, and, and I do remember that being a powerful time in my life. And, and I this is just sort of a random thing that comes to mind. Um, but uh, my godmother, uh, was my sponsor as well. And I remember one of the um, things I wrote at the time, uh, one of the things they asked us like, what do we like about being Catholic? And I remember saying that um, that uh, what I liked about being Catholic was two things. One, that there were you know a billion other people in the world uh, that thought like you did. And, and I thought that was really powerful that, to know that you've got the, the body of Christ around you. And then also that um, that we have this God who has promised mercy uh, in confession and that no matter how much we mess up, uh, we know we can go and be forgiven. You said that in the eighth grade? <laughs> wow. Uh, so uh, that, that being the only thought I had about God that I remember, um, so it maybe sounds uh, better than it, than it was, but, um, but even still, that being the only thought I remember with the way my life went, um, certainly uh, plays itself out. Yes. Um, so then, you know, so we're, we're going to church every Sunday. Um, in high school, they started a life team uh, my junior year. Um, and so a little more background on me. Uh, I was homeschooled uh, for most of my school career. And so I, I think I went to uh, maybe a private kindergarten, and then in first grade, my mom just made this. I'm the oldest. She made the decision to homeschool me, and went on to homeschool me and all my siblings. There, I have three uh, younger siblings. What What did you do, Brian? Why What uh, What made your mom shift course? So yeah. I think she was one. nervous about what she was seeing in public schools already. Um, and you know, my parents are sort of. Uh, they were sort of like Catholic hippies from California. So they, yeah. they grew up uh, in, in Pacific Grove, uh, Big Sur area with the Redwoods and that sort of thing. They actually oh, met wow. at a Catholic summer camp, uh, you know, where they would be out among the Redwoods. And um, so their faith was definitely important to them, but then they have this sort of California hippie side too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, if you look around right now, the, the people that are like, uh, hippies and Catholics have a lot in common right now, I've noticed. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys have noticed that too, but if you think about who's having babies and that sort of thing, it's, uh, it's hippies and Catholics. St. Francis could be viewed as like the original hippie, really. <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> Barefoot talking to the birds. You know? Okay, right. Right. Yeah. among the yeah. red preach. <laughs> scripture says to preach to all creation. Uh, I had someone the other day at a at a conference say, uh, "Have you guys preached to creation lately? Have you gone out and preached the gospel to the birds, to the waves, to the <laughs> to the sun?" There's and Francis, to do that. he did that. There really is. Uh, I mean, and, and the reason I say this is because there's this connection. Like some people think that we're nothing but animals. Other people put us on the level of angels in a disembodied way. I think it's neither. It's we're human persons. So body and soul, both of us, uh, and both body and soul make up who we are, right? And so we're not to sink to the level of animals as if there's no God, but we're also not to leave creation as if it matters yeah. nothing. So really human beings 
basically serve as a bridge between creation and God to worship God and bring the rest of creation with us. Yeah, we've been given That's dominion it. and, and yeah. uh, authority. Um, Pretty it's the same The same conference, the, the lady told a story, like she, she tells this to people, um, and she, she told a story about um, one young man that had listened to her. This is African. They go on African missions a lot. And... Um, and he was like, he kept trying to plant corn at, on his property and it bordered the jungle. So he would plant the corn seeds, I guess. And um, I don't know how you plant corn, but whatever. And, and every night rats would come out of the jungle and eat all his corn. And so then he heard their talk and, uh, and they, they say, preach like this, say, uh, say rats, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. But it is not to eat my corn. <laughs> and, uh, and so this guy did this and he planted his corn again. And that night it rained and it rained for three days straight to, the, to where the corn grew up uh, enough that the rats never came back and bothered his corn ever again. Um, wow. And so she said, like, I think, uh, I think her daughter had a story of like bugs in the house or something like bugs. <laughs> God loves you. He has a plan for your life, but it is not to be in our basement. Uh, <laughs> I have a plan for your life as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's amazing. And I was going to say, can you tell the, a frog this deep theological <laughs> truth? And apparently so, all of the, all of creation. Yeah, that's really cool. I was afraid that was going to be kind of corny. But I wasn't. <laughs> it was pretty corny. <laughs> it was both. It was both. Uh, Hashtag dad jokes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. But but seriously, go preach to creation. It reminds me of St. Uh, Anthony, too. Pot nobody, nobody, yeah. No, yeah, nobody was listening. So uh, he went and gave the same homily to the fish. And then the fish were like popping that's out, right. out of the water. Exactly. That's the story I was thinking about. <laughs> and then also there's a story of St. Francis trying to give a sermon and like there was a migrating flock of birds that was so loud no one could hear him and he said you know brother and sister birds or whatever please <laughs> and that and the birds were quiet again uh, with anthony too the eucharist um <laughs> i don't remember the full details of the story but the guy bet him like well if uh oh if I have the i'll make it so this donkey doesn't eat for like three weeks and then uh so you stand there with the Holy Eucharist and I'll stand here with some food for the donkey. And if the donkey or the mule, um, you know, goes to the Eucharist, I'll, I'll believe. But if he goes to the hay, I don't believe in the Eucharist. So uh, for some reason, St. Anthony like agreed to this, which is kind of goofy. But uh, so he came out with the Blessed Sacrament. And not only did the donkey go to the Blessed Sacrament, but it kneeled and uh, bowed down before it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Well, it, one powerful thing about St. Anthony, I think it connects directly to your story, Brian, is this fact that, you know, everybody prays to St. Anthony to find whatever thing they've lost. And I have many stories of lost wallets, lost keys, everything. But I found out one day that, you know, when you make a pilgrimage to St. Anthony's tomb, people put pictures of their loved ones. Mm. And I've never thought of He's the patron of the lost, mm -hmm. not just lost stuff. And right. we live in a materialistic world, right. and, and that sense of being lost and not knowing your faith, your way, your purpose, all of that. And I think it honestly connects to all of our lives on some level. That it, you know, you ask Saint Anthony to pray for you, not just to find your wallet, but to find your way to heaven. Right? Amen. <laughs> One new. of the only things that we have that Saint Francis that we know Saint Francis wrote is a letter to Saint Anthony. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a couple sentences, and he he wrote it. Saint Anthony wrote Saint Francis asking, you know, should I be be a friar, like just you know, wandering around like you guys, or is it okay to study theology, which is what he was doing. And Francis said, you know, study theology, just don't forget that, you know, you need to serve the poor and that sort of thing too. So. Wow. The, the thing about St. Anthony is um, he's the, the saint of miracles. He's the hammer of the heretics. And like everybody's grandma prays to him to find their car keys <laughs> That's when right. they're leaving the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we could get a little more reverence for St. Anthony, yeah. that would be a good thing. I so. So back to um, my junior year, uh, uh, two things happened. So one, my parish started Life Teen. And then another thing that happened was I decided to go to public school uh, for the first time. Uh, just kind of wanted to see what it was like. So I'd been holding school the whole time. And I, I told my mom, well, I think I'd like to go to public school for a year um, because I, I kind of want to know 
you know, what it's like and be able to relate to people who went to public school their whole lives. And, um, and so I, I did that. Now I'd already started, um, and this is sort of a humble brag, I don't mean to, but I'd already started college classes uh, my sophomore year at, <laughs> at the local college through like um, wow. some, some post-secondary program you could take uh, free college classes. So I was doing college classes. So my junior year, I was actually split part-time between public high school and then the local like community college. Um, and I knew that my senior year, I was gonna go to Sweden because another thing that you need to know about me is that when I was about 10, uh, my mom had sent us to a Swedish language summer camp in the backwoods of Minnesota because when she was in college, she had done a study abroad in Sweden and had learned some of the language. My dad worked as a contractor for the German military at the same time and he would go up and visit, um, which is a story in itself. But anyway, uh, she'd always loved Sweden and, and the Swedish people, the Swedish language. So she heard about these language camps and you go for a certain number of weeks during the summer and it's full immersion. So the only time the counselors speak English is in an emergency or maybe on the first day orientation telling you where the bathrooms are and then it's total immersion. And uh, so I did that basically every summer. And then in high school, you can go for four weeks and get a year's worth of high school credit in whatever foreign language. So I was homeschooled. So my high school foreign language was Swedish. I'm probably one of the only- That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> one of the only ones I've in ever the country. heard of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, you got, you've, you've got to respond to the, the language question. Say something in Swedish for us, Brad. Uh, oh, of course. Right. Okay, so y'all can say a vad som helst på svenska. Uh, jag var nästan flytande. Uh, nu för tiden har jag glömt några saker, men uh, ändå kan jag prata svenska ganska bra. I think I'm uh, offended. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, what uh, so I'll leave it to the Swedes who are watching. To <laughs> really? Really? No, 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 no. I mean, I was just rambling about what uh, kind of Swedish. I said I can say some things. I used to be fluent. Yeah. I'm not so much anymore. But um, That's cool. But anyway, so uh, a lot of the counselors there were former Americans who went to Sweden as exchange students. And I really loved the camp. And so that inspired me to want to do the same thing my senior year of high school. So I knew that was coming and I decided that I wanted to go to public school my junior year. So, uh, but, but I really wanted to talk about that life team year because I had a, we had a newly hired youth minister who was implementing this life team um, program. And back then, um, and this doesn't feel like that long ago, but really in youth ministry years, it was a long time ago. Everybody at the parish, like the parents all just sent their kids to youth ministry still. I think that culture is sort of, um, moved on in some sense yeah but uh, back then you know we immediately had like 40 kids a week um, because it was just expected that you were going to youth ministry at the church and um, so we I remember I was on the like peer leadership team that year um, I don't remember how it came up that I was invited but the youth minister invited me so I gave like a testimony on a retreat that year and I forgot when I went to adoration after I came back to the church years later I'd forgotten that that I had ever been to adoration but I had um, a few times uh, it, or at least once on that retreat and it, it didn't come back until a couple years into my journey home, if you will. Um, but anyway, I know there was a lot of grace uh, that year. So um, that kind of gets me through high school, but well, that gets me through American high school. Then I went to Sweden right. and in Sweden, I, I sort of lost my faith. Um, and so uh, that might be a, a good place to yeah, uh, yeah. To, I, to pause. I, and I think that's a good, yeah. definitely a good place to pause because you know this is kind of the moment most young people like start to lose themselves mm -hmm. and in our c culture today especially like kids um, they get a driver's license they get a job and they get out and it's very hard to retain them at the parish level in their own families and there's this deep search I mean I remember going on that search myself you know, it was the grace of God, obviously, in all of our lives that bring us back or preserve us in some level. But many young people don't respond to that grace, don't understand that grace, don't recognize that grace. Um, and so I think it's, it's amazing that God definitely has brought you back <laughs> on some level. So there's a lot of hope for this story, even though you say you lost your faith. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and obviously St. Anthony, St. Francis, <laughs> all the saints praying for you and your family yeah. on some level. Yeah. Uh, and that's a that's a great gift. So, um, but I think right now, if you wanted to, we can wait till the next segment. Uh, I thank you all for watching this uh, segment. And uh, now let's uh, find out what Brian did in Sweden and in college <laughs> after this. <laughs> Hey everyone, this week's episode is sponsored by Family Renewal Project. FRP is a local theology of the body apostolate in service to the Archdiocese of Louisville. They're dedicated to renewing the culture through the renewal of the family. They have so many amazing things going on, so check them out at familyrenewalproject.com. Welcome back everyone to Spirit Inspire. Today's episode, we've been talking to Brian Kane about his story and uh, we're getting into some of the heart of that sense of uh, searching that he was doing as he uh, traveled to Sweden and into the future. So Brian, can you continue the story? I can. Awesome. Uh, and and I, I, uh, I know what you mean by the searching I was doing, although I think We'll get there, but this is actually the part of like no searching or maybe the opposite of searching <laughs> where it was uh, just like losing myself in in the the pleasures of the world. So but be careful there. Okay. There is a searching. I mean, J.K. Right. Chesterton even said every man not to equate you no, to no, this yeah. <laughs> moment, but you know, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. So even the jaded cynicism, any any kind of giving yourself out of the world's pleasures is searching even if it's highly misdirected. Okay, so well that's that fair around. enough. All right, well in that sense, I was in the in the G.K. Chesterton sense, now I was searching. Now we set your story straight. Yeah, exactly. That's right, in that's the, right. In the conscious searching, there was there, there was none of that. Sure. Um, <laughs> like I said, probably the opposite. So anyway, so I went to Sweden. In Sweden, only 2% of people go to church every Sunday. Um, so, you know, I was with a host family. They, they didn't go to church on Sundays. Um, and so, uh, you know, with no one to sort of be the motivation, um, I stopped going to church. Uh, I remember praying one time during that year, and it stands out as a moment of consciousness. Um, I had several years of sort of unconsciousness, I think. Um, and uh, but, but I had a, a nightmare one night that one of my friends had been hit by a car and died in my arms in the middle of the street. Very vivid dream. I was like convinced that that had actually happened or something. It was so vivid uh, that, that that friend was fine. But I remember praying for for my friend in that moment. And that is the only time I remember praying that whole year. Uh, but I you know, started to get into sort of the, the hedonism uh, in, in that time. Uh, that's when I started drinking. Um, started, you know, uh, focusing more on on girls uh, than I than I perhaps had, and um, and yeah, so just kind of turned myself over to the world in that sense, and started uh, to seek out um, worldly pre- pleasures. Fell in with a friend group that that was very much into that, and um, and so by the end of uh, my year in Sweden, I think I was you know agnostic. Uh, you know, and, and sort of just, uh, have you ever heard the term apatheist, uh, apathetic, no, that's, that's good, apathetic that's to one. the idea of God? That's um, good. So I was probably an apatheist by the end of, uh, of my year in Sweden. I had applied to um, the Honors Tutorial College, another humble brag, at Ohio University. Um, and, uh, and I had been accepted there for a degree in video production. And the Honors Tutorial College is a really cool um, program there that I'll, I'll give a, a shout out to. Uh, it's one of the only tutorial systems outside of like Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and one of maybe two in the United States, uh, where each quarter you design your own class. Um, wow. with a one-on-one with a professor. And so you're kind of doing these, these tutorials. And, um, and so I was very honored and excited to be accepted into that. Um, and I'd fallen in love with like making movies and doing uh, you know, funny stuff and, you know, throughout high school. And then I'd uh, been involved with some, some media stuff in Sweden as well. And so this is, uh, I, I did my college interview over the phone from Sweden. Uh, wow. <laughs> my mom, uh, who is an amazingly hard worker and incredibly supportive uh, mom, did a lot of my 
you know, paperwork shuffling and whatnot in the United States as I was uh, abroad. Um, so went off to college, uh, you know, had a sort of prototypical uh, American college experience where that, that just sort of escalated um, the things that, that I had started in Sweden. Uh, drugs became a part of uh, my lifestyle and, and just more and more sinful um, uh, relationships and things like that. So. Yeah. Um, it was around the same time that, uh, or well, it was in college that uh, I started spending a lot of time on YouTube. This was the era of the new atheists. Yep. Uh, I don't know how much role the new atheists played in your, your all's lives, but uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris uh, became uh, heroes of mine. What was the fourth guy's name? Daniel, Daniel Dennett. Dennett. Yeah, he, he, he was one of the, they called him the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, he like, Dropped off the radar real quick. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he didn't. I remember those guys on YouTube. Yeah. I just thankfully didn't get as sucked in, but I understand the <laughs> the compelling arguments mm -hmm. on that level. It's interesting. The, those on the guys, brilliant rhetoric too. Yes, that's so really even more than the. That's arguments. really the key because for a lot of them, the the arguments are very very bad, very shallow. Yeah. Oh, well, true. It's but, rhetoric, right? <laughs> but when you think of, and this actually interests me, because when you think of the previous atheist things, think people like Russell, for example, yeah, yeah. they were, you know, very intelligent. They could put together strong arguments, yeah. good objections. Like, uh, like, like Russell's argument, like, it wasn't right for Christ to curse the fig tree. What, <laughs> what did the fig tree do and why, why I'm not a Christian? Which is sort some, of uh, some good argument. Alex O'Connor's <laughs> argument now, but it yeah, replaced the fig tree with pigs. But, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. But I think that's, uh, I think the, the four horsemen, I, I guess I kind of call them like pop atheists. Right. And I think that even though their arguments weren't as good, I think they had a bigger impact just due to the popularity. No right? doubt about it. Like you listen to Hitchens and from a philosophical perspective, it's pretty lame. But man, he scores some zingers in his. Oh, rhetoric, I, I love you know? Chris Hitchens. I, I pray for him. Like I, I yeah. hope he's in heaven. Like I, I think he earnestly, on some level, wanted, um, wanted to be good. Why were they called um, the Four Horsemen? Because there was four of them. Yeah, they and they were they were bringing about the the apocalypse, the death of God. You know, oh my yeah. God. I think they probably named themselves that. Uh, probably. Let's, let's I listen to the four uh, horsemen of the new atheism, right? Yeah, yeah. I feel like there was one. Po well, it was. I don't know if it was called a podcast back then, but there was one session they did on YouTube where they were four in the same room together. I don't. I don't know how. I don't think I don't I've think ever that seen that. Yeah. Happened very often. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my favorite was Christopher Hitchens, as I sort of mentioned just now. Um, and again, brilliant rhetorician. Um, what I was drawn to, I, I realized in retrospect, was uh, obviously his sense of humor, but also his, um, and this is sort of what Dawkins has too, is is just their like the sneering Britishness of uh, of their arguments, um, and you know they they take the moral high ground simply by looking down on anyone who disagrees with them and, and anyone yeah. who argues against them. And it's a, it's incredible how much power uh, snideness and yeah. sneering has in rhetoric. Snob appeal. Um, yeah, yeah. If you want to be intellectual, and you want to be a good, decent person, you should be an atheist. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I want to be that way. <laughs> That's right. I want to be one of these brilliant guys. That's right, yeah. exactly. And so I, I jumped in feet first. So by the end of college, I was, you know, addicted to a lot of things, as I've sort of alluded to, and then also considered myself an atheist and even an anti-theist. So I went from apatheist uh, at the end of high school to anti-theist by the end of college, and that that being actively trying to deconvert people from religion because I thought it was an opiate of the masses. I thought it was this, uh, you know, toxic force in the world. Brian, I want to press into that, <laughs> that I, reality I of your personality. <laughs> because your personality is a go-getter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are ready to change the world. Mm -hmm. And so think of that, all of that lostness that you're describing, it is misdirected desire. You were in fact searching during that time, even with the drugs, even with the, any of it, right? And still evangelizing. Oh, and, and still evangelizing. I your agree. heart yep. was for evangelization. It just, it was, it, it's both misdirected, but also, twisted mm -hmm. and it was about untwisting those lies so that then you could direct it the way you obviously are today i mean that's brilliant 
what God was allowing in your life so that he could see, give you the ability to see what you see now. Yeah. Can I kind of dig in here too, because this is obviously a big point of interest to me because the whole sort of theist atheist debate is interesting to me. Was this, this experience, was it sort of general as you've described it, the appeal of these men, or were there any particular arguments you kind of could sink your teeth into that made you feel that theism or religion really was, you know, had been disproven or was silly? Was there anything specific? Yeah, it's a great cool. question. Um, so, <clears throat> so on the one hand, I, I mentioned that I don't think I was super well catechized. Excuse me, let me drink a water here. And while you're doing that, I'll just also mention one other thing about <clears throat> those guys and some others is they're not always wrong. They, they point out a lot of like hypocrisy, mm -hmm. a lot of really silly stuff. And I mean, I got to give them props for that. They're right about a fair number of things. Sure. Trimming the fat. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so one thing that comes to mind is uh, that uh, I, I thought the anthro, uh, I, I forget it. Well, I don't know if it's, Dawkins talks about like the, the anthropomorphic principle or something. I forget what he calls it, but basically <clears throat> this idea that we, as humans, like make ourselves the center of the universe and sort of uh, use us being here and, and and trying to think of a way to justify Anthrop how we're here. Anthropocentric. And, yeah, maybe like maybe maybe that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought that was interesting. The one that I really found striking also, uh, and this isn't really an argument. It's just like, well, you know. If you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu. Right. If you were born in Japan, you'd, you know, I don't know, maybe be a Christian if the missionaries had gotten to you. No. Um, <laughs> if you were, but, if, but since you're born in America, you know, you're Christian. Right. And, and I remember, you know, swallowing that. Um, what does that, so what does that mean? Because I've heard the argument before, like as an argument, is it saying that there's no objective reality behind the religion? You just kind of are how you're raised? I think that, yeah, the, the, how you're raised has the biggest influence on you. It's not actually the truth of the matter that you're just kind of going along with whatever your parents said. Um, so I remember thinking that was powerful. Um, but, but yeah, so, so John, you're right that I had moved into searching as well, though. Like, so the, the first half of college was, was you know, the G.K. Ch Chesterton searching. Yes. <laughs> as YouTube came around in these atheists. Um, so one, sort of what I started to say before I choked was... Um, I didn't get a great um, kind of, or I didn't think I got a great religious education because I hadn't heard any pro-God arguments. Yeah. Um, or if I had, they hadn't made sense or I hadn't remembered them. Um, so to well, be the charitable answers, to the people who did religious sure. education, maybe maybe I just didn't remember them. Um, but then- There's truth I'll, there too. Exactly. And then- um, Pause. <laughs> Go back. Okay. And we'll have to edit yeah. that. That's okay. So, uh, I think we forgot to put those. On no, the... I put them up. Oh, you did put yeah. them up? Oh, okay. Um, so, the, uh, let's see. So, I was saying that um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if I understood any arguments for God's existence before I encountered arguments against God's existence. Right. So, one, I had no tools in my tool belt to defend myself against these arguments. And, and again, they're not really, you know, well reasoned or they're not really uh, even necessarily well articulated other than they come with a good amount of really, really professional rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but I was searching at that point and, and it did make me think about God's existence and morality. And, um, and I really did become very passionate about being moral. And, and, and that's where I say, uh, I think Christopher Hitchens was also obsessed with that, yeah. again, in a, in a probably negative way. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so I left college in anti-theist and, and some of these arguments had, and problem to evil, was another one that, it, that always a big one, you know, yeah. that was very powerful. So I left college, kind of a um, uh, yeah, atheist evangelist, and it and it was that personality that wants to change the world. And it was, you know, I connect to Saint, Saint Paul's over your shoulder, John. I don't think he's in uh, in our uh, you know multi shot here, but uh, I've always connected with Saint Paul. So it's the same zeal that that uh, leads him 
killing Christians yeah. that ultimately leads to him being, you know, one of the greatest exactly. evangelists in history. So it's yes. same personality directed from the the misguided evil to the good. Um, and so there's definitely an element of that in my life, I hope. And, um, and uh, yeah. So. Well, uh, think of these as layers that God is putting in your life to, I think, help solidify your conviction, mm-hmm. your clarity, your confidence mm-hmm. in this conversion. Right? Now, all of that, I think, is is invaluable to be grateful for, to be appreciative uh, of, and I think it gives you empathy and the ability to see from the perspective of those very people, mm-hmm. uh, and to many perhaps pull many onto the other side um, through that process. That's a gift. I think so. So, Brian, during this period, did you? Was this transition to atheism and anti-theism, did it come with any moments of, well, I'm convinced by these arguments, but I wish God existed, that'd be nice, or was it more of a, well, that's a bunch of nonsense, I'm so happy to have gotten past this. Did you? Was there any missing missing God? I would say things like that. I think I was just repeating what I had heard on YouTube, mm-hmm. you know. Recovering well, I would Catholic. Love, yeah, I would something. love if, if God existed and there was a heaven and I could go there, but you know, that's silly stuff. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I still don't, I don't know that I'm still a very deep thinker, but I don't think I, I, I was, you know, on some level a deep thinker then, but I, but I was also just, um, you know, as we all are, influenced by the people around me, sure. influenced by what I was watching, and, um, and so in some ways just also regurgitating what, yeah. what I was hearing. Did you have any passionate Facebook debates that you would like to share with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, this I, was the MySpace era. No, 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 no right. sorry, I forgot. Uh, right. Excuse me. I was uh, one of the first people not at Harvard on MySpace. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> not on MySpace, on Facebook. MySpace, what is that? Uh, I was on Facebook. Zanga. I was right, on right. Facebook when you still needed a university email uh, to be on Facebook. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's, That's ancient history. That was before the moms. Maybe, That's right. maybe exactly. some of those debates also took place on AIM, AOL, Instant <laughs> Messenger, that, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's 10 years before. That's 10 years before. That's right. um, they were di- it was dial-up. I, I was always I was always <laughs> making trouble on Facebook, and, and if anyone seriously engaged me, I was so snarky and uh, sarcastic and dismissive that I never actually, I don't think, really engaged with people. Oh, so you were a troll. I was basically, <laughs> yeah. I was, my whole life <laughs> was, was a troll, and now I'm a Catholic troll. Uh, that's so, not bad. That's um, not bad. No. Um, but yeah, no, I have a, a long, sordid history of, of obnoxious Facebook posts, and they continue into the future. I, I try to, I try to <laughs> and fail to ask the Holy Spirit every time before I post on Facebook, is this contributing to the good of the world? And, you know, when I ask that, I usually don't write the post. And then if I don't <laughs> ask it, I do write the post and regret it one to three hours later. Well, and especially, too, as we all know, that Facebook debates, especially when they get really snarky, almost inevitably end up changing somebody's opinion. Correct. It always is, no, right? Yeah. Unfailing. It's amazing what a force for good Facebook is. YouTube comments, even better. <laughs> yeah. That's where the real action yeah. happens. So I, uh, I also use Reddit, which I don't necessarily recommend. Really <laughs> um, but to, to provide a counterpoint, when you can reasoned... Uh, with grace and charity engage someone online. I did have, um, I got a random message, this was a few years ago, but someone sent me a private message on Reddit, like, hey, I just wanted to say, um, related to our conversation from like two years ago, you were right, Um, I was wrong, I'm a Christian now. Um, And so like, this is not something I had remembered, I went back and looked at the thread. And, um, but somehow this had made an impact on this person. I have no idea who it is, they're anonymous. Um, but you know, if you ask the Holy Spirit and he still says, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, it's not like never use social media. But. Right, right, right. Because social media is another great frontier. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a world kind of like the Wild West. You don't know how to tame it. You don't know how to understand it. <laughs> it's a great analogy. It so, is. Speaking of the Wild West, after college, I moved to Los Angeles to oh. pursue a career in comedy. That's an exciting thing. And I think that probably makes uh, makes it clear that we need to pause because that's a big frontier that, uh, that I think we'll catch up in our next segment. Y'all ready for that? 
Sounds good. Yeah. All right. See you then. We'll see you all then. Thank you. Hey everyone, another sponsor for today's episode is the Cathedral of the Assumption in the heart of downtown Louisville, Kentucky. It is the spiritual center of parish and family life and is a historic treasure for the Catholic Church in America. Take a tour or consider visiting for Mass. Check them out at cathedraloftheassumption.org. Welcome back to Spirit Inspire. This is our third segment with Brian Kane. He's telling his story from Sweden to college and now into Los Angeles. So give us some ideas. What was that like working in comedy and all that that world offered? Spoilers. No, I'm just <laughs> How did so, you go from what you were doing to comedy? Yeah, that, that's yeah. true. What okay. made you decide Because we know Brian and he's that. not funny. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I was hilarious. the straight man. You're actually yeah, hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so how I went, I mean, it was a somewhat natural tra tra uh, transition. So I went to college pursuing video production, especially enjoying comedy. Okay. Um, I started in my college sketch, sketch comedy troupe. And then also, uh, I'm struggling with words here, auditioned for the college improv comedy troupe and got into that. So I did improv comedy all through college and that was what I fell in love with. That became uh -huh. my, my true passion. And, um, and so when I was deciding what I was gonna do after college, um, I wanted to do improv. And in my mind, there were there's only really three big places where you do improv in the United States, which is uh, New York, Los Angeles, and then Improv Mecca is Chicago. So I didn't want to live in a city as big as New York um, or as tightly packed as New York. So between Los Angeles and Chicago, I decided to go uh, Los Angeles. I knew more people there. One of my good friends was there. Mm. And then um, and then I figured maybe I could get a job in video production um, uh, you know, to support myself. So I moved out to LA. I ended up getting a job at uh, Warner Brothers because I spoke Swedish. So, uh, <laughs> that, that's just so cool. So like, they, they mm. needed a Swedish speaker for uh, doing some auditing of travel and expense reports uh, mm -hmm. because they were moving. The, the Burbank office was going to take over global travel and expense and Sweden asked for a Swedish speaker. And so random Brian, <laughs> <laughs> fresh off the boat in Los Angeles, uh, my temp agency was like, hey, we have someone looking for a Swedish speaker, which was on my resume. And uh, so I interviewed with an amazing lady who became, you know, one of a, a boss, you know, for a long time in Los Angeles, and a uh, very devout lady, um, holy lady, who really helped me develop professionally. And um, but anyway, she took a chance on random college get out of college with a video production degree, um, and uh, you know, it was very it was simple math, but it was basically a, you know an accounting math job, and um, in Sweden. No, 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 it's in Burbank, California, Los Angeles, California. No, no, no. right, but there was a so translation there, kind of deal. Yeah, so, there. I mean, that, that was like, that ended up being probably like 3% of my job, and most Swedes speak English too, so even with a lot of the Swedes, I didn't speak mm -hmm. uh, Swedish, but there were a couple of people that, that enjoyed speaking Swedish with me. Um, <laughs> But uh, anyway, so I started working at Warner Brothers. I was full time during the day uh, as a temp. And then I started doing improv nights and weekends. Um, my improv career uh, was awesome. I met lots of amazing people. Uh, I started a team called Robot Teammate and the Accidental Party uh, with some friends. And um, the title alone. <laughs> what? What? Uh, and so our, our team. Uh, was great. Um, we we incorporated as a as an LLC. Um, we used to do these things called cage matches, where you would go and then the the audience would vote what team was going to come back the next week. And as far as I know, we set a unbroken global record at eighty six wins in a row. That's so amazing. for <laughs> for over a year and a half, uh, we won the audience vote over and over. Wow. Um, and and as yeah, like I said, as far as I know, that that's a streak that's not broken. Um, so we were really good. We were starting to get paid. By the time I left LA, like seven years later, we were starting to get paid to coach and um, go do workshops and shows. So, you know, I remember posting a Facebook status at one point that said, I am now a professional improviser, the, the first time that I'd been paid to do improv. Um, so that was sort of happening on the one side. And then on the spiritual side, um, I was very much in the same vein of, you know, sort of pleasure for pleasure's sake. Um, but still this like 
atheistic evangelization. I started to soften as I got older. Ron Paul, the libertarian, uh, <laughs> had a big impact on me politically. Mm. Um, and I started to not toe as many party lines sort of on the on the liberal side of things. And then, um, and, and I think that opened me up. I was still very interested in morality. Um, and, and part of what I realized was just a softening of the heart in, in the sense of, um, you know, okay, maybe religion's not this like evil empire that's seeking to destroy all of humanity. And maybe it's just a delusion and, the, and, and every religious person I, sh I should treat with uh, more care and uh, compassion and tenderness, more like a lost puppy than a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a Mongolian barbarian or something. Um, <laughs> that was a, a, a weird reference. Sorry to all the Mongolians watching. <laughs> uh, what, I'm not going to have a pretty large singing, but it is one of my favorite uh favorite forms of music. Do we have a fairly large Mongolian fan base? <laughs> I think, I think we sure do. We I think, yeah, we've got Swedes and Mongolians. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, we just so. disenfranchised half of our audience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, right, right. <laughs> and for that reason, I'm out. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so, uh, but I was really concerned with morality, and, and I remember a moment uh, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly when this was. So I graduated college in 2009. And so over the next couple of years, I was softening. And I remember this moment because I would just consume hours and hours of debates of atheists and Christians and, uh, you know, different people. And I, I, I had this thought pop into my head, which I now think was a great sense of this very moment. I've never said that before. Uh, I now think, you know, may have been the Holy Spirit saying, um, you know, if... If I really believe what I tell everyone about atheism and all this stuff, like why why am I so consumed with this question? Why am I pursuing this as if there's an answer that's not the one that I say it is? Right. Um, and that that had a big moment, or that was a big moment for me, and that started my shift out of atheism again and back into agnosticism. Like maybe I don't have it all figured out. Why do I have this? burning desire to know things that I think aren't true. That doesn't make any sense. So when uh, you've mentioned morality a couple of times and from having been an atheist, but you're very interested in morality, mm -hmm. what did that look like to you? Because I know you've said a few times that as far as maybe lifestyle, you weren't you know, going by what we would think of as the sure. traditional Judeo-Christian morals, um, but we're also pursuing morals. So what kind of morals are you interested in? Uh, you know, I think sort of the vague uh, relativistic uh, morality of like being a good person. I mean, there was certainly a discrepancy between what I like the burdens I put on other people. You know, the the, the log in my own eye was very large yeah. and I saw a lot of logs in other people's eyes uh, that I thought were bigger than mine that probably probably weren't. Um, and so it was it was very much disconnected between what I was doing on a day to day basis, at least intellectually it was, um, and, and what I was saying was the right way to go. Now, you know, there was also some level of twistedness, like John was alluding to, like, you know, oh, being promiscuous is actually a freedom. It's like and, you know, so yeah. it's like, yeah, exactly. So, um, so you can and do so those religion things. is bad because it is Keeping people and, from the freedom that's that they often should the, naturally the have. False uh, paradigm that many people in that lifestyle believe that oh well if we can outlaw law and order and in other words ordered liberty, then the true free love can reign. Right. When in truth it really just enslaves us to our own desires. We create unhealthy demands upon our body, our minds, our hearts. And that's and partners. What, and partners. And yeah. it creates this pattern, this lifestyle, yeah. where you literally have to build a dome of keeping out the truth, the beauty, the goodness of reality, mm -hmm. so that you can continue to perpetuate your own paradigm, yeah. your own beliefs, your worldview. And that's exhausting, I bet. <laughs> you yeah. know, I've not, lived it too. I've lived it too. You're not any more free, right? Like, um, I've heard this analogy a bunch this week, but. Um, you have a, a piano player, and if you, you have a, a child who wants to learn, 
They don't let the uh, the teacher doesn't let the child just hit all the keys and make whatever noise they want, even though that would give the child, you know, what what we now consider to have more freedom and liberty is all oh, just do whatever you want. No, they teach the child how to play the piano, and now now the child can play any number of songs, and they're actually much more free and create new songs and because they know songs. the rules. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but it has to go through that stage of discipline and learning and, yeah. And even using the discordant notes in our lives mm -hmm. to create a new tune, but within the still ordered structure of the piano itself, the instrument, whatever it may be. And that, that, that's the hard part because there's real experiences of human suffering. Uh, confusion, loss, many broken hearts. I, I broke many women's hearts, uh, you know, and uh, used uh, women and and used friends, and you know, it's just you know, you're leaving this trail of destruction, um, you know, in your. How did you and, How did you work through that though? That well, that's that's, that's, that's the, down the road. That's yeah. that's that's skipping ahead a couple of years. Oh, okay, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> sorry. Didn't I, I mean, I, in some ways, I'm still working through. I, you know, I tell, you know, I was a youth minister before this current job, and I, I tell kids, you know, um, in my perspective is that, you know, yeah, like the, the, the promiscuous lifestyle, you know, it seems maybe like a good idea at the time, or at least it did for me. And, um, you know, you, you, yeah, you recognize like that you're breaking people's hearts, but that's just part of life and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and then when I found the woman I would ultimately marry and got married and had everything, you know, sort of contextualized, all of a sudden all those relationships are viewed through a completely different lens. And it's not, for me, it wasn't until the contrast of a healthy, good, yeah. holy relationship. Then I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> That's why every person that was wise and loved me counseled me not to do those things. Um, it was because then they just turn into shame and guilt and regret and um, and, and haunted dreams and um, and moments of um, distraction as I'm living my life now and um, and fears and you know so those things really haunt you and so in a lot of ways I, you know I'm still working through that and and I don't know that. I don't know that I will be worked through all that prior to um, to death, and and uh, you know I th I think God can heal me of all that, um, but but it's certainly ongoing. Brian, what did that do to your sense of masculinity, though? <clears throat> um, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought much about masculinity at that time, other than you know masculinity to me at that time was was a very conquer it you know it was the epitome of sort of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. like what yeah you know the the sort of cliche would be it, you know it's a conquering masculinity it's a use masculinity it's a um like you're not it wasn't necessarily defined by things internal um but things that that i did or or ways i acted or you know a certain confidence that i had talking to women um, you know, and, and a, a, usually a false confidence or a, or a feigned or yeah, somewhat uh, manipulative. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you, I don't think you can live that life without being manipulative on some level. I think it becomes kind of like a, like a false standard. Like I'm more of a man if I, you know, picked up the girl in the bar and if I fail, I'm like somehow less of a man mm -hmm. kind of thing. And, yes. you know, I remember in my own life, going through a period I was very socially awkward and beginning to get out and maybe go dancing, go to the bar, whatever. And uh, even though morally I knew better, uh, there was this kind of like impressed admiration for the guy that's always picking up the girl, you know, and how do I do that? And probably in some ways made me feel less manly you know, less less masculine. Back to your point. Y yes. Um, even though it's just a complete reversal of of the truth. 
Yes, I mean, I was on Western Kentucky's baseball team, D1 school, big guys in the locker room that were 100 pounds heavier than I was and could squat 300 pounds more than I ever could dream of, right? And all they were doing, not all of them, some of were good men, right? But many of these guys, 18, 19, 20-year-old hotshots who think they're never going to die, are talking about how many women they've conquered and all of the different things that they thought made them men. And I felt just this emptiness. And yet, at the same time, I felt peer pressure. Like, oh, that's what it means to be cool. That what it, yeah. That's what it means to belong. And so how easy that is to be pulled into, mm -hmm. you know? So and to your just, point, oh, sorry, real quick, Ryan. To your point, that is the epitome of toxic masculinity. And I think it's not so much that masculinity per se is toxic, it's this false it's notion false. Yes, of masculinity. Yes, it's not masculinity. Because like, that's not what it means to be, to be really be Correct. a man. That's, right. you know. Authentic um, masculinity is what we're talking about. Right. right. Yeah, toxic masculinity isn't even masculine. Right. Precisely. Exactly. It's a twist, it's a lie. Yes. Uh, and yeah, so um, anyway, uh, so I think that was, um, that gives you a good sense of where I was um, in 2012 when um, I had my Christmas miracle. A Christmas miracle? Yeah. I knew you were getting there. <laughs> I knew you, I've only heard this like one time in the past several years we've known each other, but I'm very, very excited to hear this because Christmas is what it's all about, right? The incarnation, what does Jesus do in each of our lives and so that story will be our next and final segment so uh, we will see you then hey everyone our final sponsor today is re catholic re catholic has lots of treasures on their site including confession cards with a saint a prayer and a qr code for further resources that priests can use in the confessional to help lead their parishioners deeper into their faith consider buying some cards for your priest at recatholic.org or ccards.org. Welcome back to Spirit Inspire, our fourth and final segment of this episode. We've been interviewing Brian Kane, one of our uh, partners in this grand adventure, and he's been guiding us through his story, where he's come from, from uh, his infancy all the way through Sweden and college and LA for comedy and improv. And there's so much more to Brian that we obviously will not complete this story in this time together in this episode, but at least to get a little bit into the Christmas miracle he uh, talked about in our last segment. I'll pass it back to Brian and let's see what uh, he has to share with us. So Brian, All what, right. what's going on with this? Okay, so it's 2012. All right. Uh, when I tell this story to, to the youths, uh, I have to say, you may remember, you may not, that 2012 was the year that the Mayan calendar was supposed to end. Oh, oh that's yes! Right. That's right. <laughs> yes, Doomsday uh, 2012. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. never forget so, that. So uh, <laughs> there was a weird tension in the air, uh, yeah. almost globally. Yeah, I remember uh, that. That I sort of remember um, people, like, there were, like, you know, I don't think everybody was, like, super seriously questioning it, but there was this, you know, like, Okay, maybe it's a 0.03% chance that the world ends this no, year. I felt it. Like, I was a Catholic at yeah. the time, and I saw this kind of superstitious thing about, yeah. like, ooh, what's going on? I happen? feel like that may have been even bigger than the whole Y2K thing that mm -hmm. I don't really it remember was. much. It for sure was. Yes. Well, I, I just remember, um, like, my memories of being anxious about... Maybe it's because we were older, though, because I do remember Y2K being huge for yeah. people older than us. Yeah. Yeah, 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 2008 is when I remember really thinking, in 2009, thinking about 2012. Yeah. Like, what's going <laughs> to happen I'll be a sophomore in college like but I think what what um, what at least for in my experience what what made my fears go away was that that John Cusack movie was it a John Cusack movie <laughs> 2012 the movie no, I didn't remember I'm gonna, that I'm gonna, I remember that yeah, yeah I'm gonna, have to watch that I haven't I haven't movie, seen right? it since 2011 or whenever it came out but uh I'll drop that one on the you recommend know, list. It, that was the same year I read the book by David Curry. He's a Catholic convert. He said it, the book's titled What Jesus Really Said About the End of the World. Mm. And he broke down scripture, and that gave me peace of mind, so I wasn't <laughs> terrified. But well, I didn't have these still... great resources of scripture and John Cusack's 2012 <laughs> Sorry, Brian. The movie. Well, God um, worked in his own way. Right, right. I'd hate to say that, and it's like another actor or something. <laughs> I think it was John Cusack. Uh, it's okay. I think, like, 
zero people are gonna go. Remember that check, movie? Fact check you. Yeah, actually, yeah. the entire audience. Is we'll add it in the show notes. We'll add it in the something. show notes. It's like actually, it was someone else. No. Um, okay. So anyway, so it was 2012. So I, I said I'd moved back into agnosticism. I was still involved in drug culture and promiscuity and stuff like that. And I started to have this sense that uh, that the universe was talking to me. That was and, the drugs. Well, and that, <laughs> and that was a possibility I seriously <laughs> considered. Um, At least you were aware of that, right? <laughs> and which was part of the journey. It was like, okay, I might just be crazy, but I've always heard that crazy people don't know if they're crazy. Right. Um, you know, everybody treats me like I'm saying, I have a job, <laughs> I have a girlfriend. Um, you know, I have friends. It seems like I'm okay, but also I think the universe is talking to me. <laughs> um, and like there were, there were just weird moments. Um, and and uh, yeah, so like I, I had moments of like I, I would think I would hear my voice, uh, someone saying, or not my voice. I, I would think I was hearing someone say my name behind me, like Brian, and you know, no one's there, or. Uh, or one time I thought I saw the Virgin Mary like reflected in my friend's eyes. And I wasn't really thinking about Christianity on a regular basis. So that was a, a weird intrusive thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was, there was just a lot of like these sort of, quins- I would turn on the radio and like the line from the song would seem like related to what I was just thinking. Like, it, you know, what I think of now as Providence, I was experiencing for the first time. Wow. This is an invasion of grace coming. Oh, that's beautiful. That's uh, mm-hmm. we we have that phrase from Bishop Barron's uh, um, homily. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, homily at adoration is that? Can you? It's not a homily during adoration. Reflection. 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 Bishop Barron gave a reflection at World Youth Day in Panama. John and I were there during adoration for the English speaking population, and he talked about the invasion of grace. How that's, how God makes the first move, and we respond to it. Yes, and yes. Uh, he also talked about Duke in Altum, into, into the deep. The deep. <laughs> Um, it was amazing. And this is God going into yeah. the deep in your life. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, it's so powerful. Okay, so yeah, so uh, it was it was nearing the end of 2012, and I had a conversation with a friend. I was, I've, I've always been very nerdy, um, and I, I was on a YouTube show called Anim Fantastic that my buddies and I produced. It was about animation, uh, and I was the news guy. They were the really big nerds, and, but I uh, they hired me. Uh, for free to read uh, read the animation for news, <laughs> um, but one one time uh, one time my friend was like, "Oh, there's this new Star Wars game, uh, Star Wars: uh, The Old Republic video game, and it's like World of Warcraft but Star Wars." Well, I had been a big World of Warcraft guy. Um, it was it was a fond memory. My dad played World of Warcraft with me. Um, my brother at times and uh, so you know I logged many hours in fact uh, this is embarrassing and I hate to say it but the the day I quit World of Warcraft was when I typed slash played and it shows you how much time you've spent in the game on your account and it was 30 days that I had spent in this virtual world, uh, and and it, that was a wake up call. <laughs> it's a month of your life. That was yeah. a month of my life that I played a World of Warcraft. I know the World of Warcraft world like I lived there. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, anyway, were, were think, you in the World of Warcraft when they had the Panda expansion? That was right before. That was that was coming out as I was dipping out. Yeah, that was I the mist mist of Pandaria. But, but to think, yeah, Brian, yeah. <laughs> that there are people, young people, older people that are spending more time there. My rule was that I would never turn down an in real life opportunity for um, to play World of Warcraft, like if my friends invited me to something. And, and when I started to get temptations to do that around the same time, that was when I said, okay. Because of the pandas. This is, it, was the, it was the pandas, honestly. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, uh, but this, I was very excited. I'm a big Star Wars fan, yeah. World of Warcraft game, like with Star Wars. Um, and so I was like, oh, I, well, I gotta play this. And it's free. You can play it for free. Well, I always had a Mac. This was a PC game. And, uh, but Mac, uh, a while back, came out with Boot Camp. You could run Windows on yes. your Macintosh. That's something yes. I'd always wanted to do, but it never, never done. Well, 
uh, that began be, began a series of hilarious events of me trying to install Windows so that I could play this game on my computer, and like just thing after thing went wrong. Like the 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 I bought Windows, but it, it was Windows 8, and it was so new that Boot Camp didn't run it. And then, uh, like, the new boot camp didn't work on that, my type of computer. And my CD-ROM drive was broken, so I couldn't install it be, even when I had the <laughs> CD. And I bought a USB drive. And, like, it was just, like, it, thing after thing over weeks. Sounds like a normal uh, day to me. <laughs> <laughs> I had a podcast with my buddy at the time. And, uh, and I remember even saying on that podcast, I said, I feel like the universe is telling me that it's not the time to play this game right now. I'm too busy. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm agnostic, I, but but some of this weird stuff has started to happen. I had acknowledged at this point that, that the universe was, like, active in my life in some way. I hadn't called it God yet. Um, and, uh, and still don't. I'm not a pantheist. Uh, just a side note disclaimer asterisk. Right, right, right. But uh, it's <laughs> still, on some level, an entry point sure. for evangelization. Sure. Yeah. And so... Uh, so Anyway, that all built up to Christmas Eve. I flew home uh, to for, for vacation to spend time with my family. Arrived at home Christmas Eve. My dad's work laptop, PC, sitting on the table there. I said, Dad, there's this Star Wars game I've been trying to play for like a month and a half. Uh, you know, can I install it on, on uh, your computer? Oh, sure, Brian, go ahead. And, so I start the download. It's like 30 gigabytes or 10 gigabytes or something. It's going to take a, a really long time. There wasn't gigabit Ethernet yet for all those Gen Z or no. Um, uh, but uh, so so I start the download. We go to Mass for Christmas Eve. My family always faithful to Mass. Um, I went received communion uh, because in my mind, like my parents still thought I was Catholic. Like I know. So Wait, they, they, <laughs> like, Brian, Brian, they, they, they didn't know. Uh, they've seen all these Facebook posts. Like no, it was. It was this crazy disconnect between, it's the same with the morality, this yeah. very weird disconnect, the mask wearing, the appearances, um, that so same the, disconnect is there, right? The disconnect was on your side. Like they oh, yeah, known, oh yeah, they would have known I was Catholic, and, um, and so, you know, but I'm keeping up appearances. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I go to communion, receive uh, the Eucharist in a, in a state of mortal sin, and uh, return to the pew. I'm not struck immediately dead, praise God, because um, I would have gone to hell if I had been. And then... Um, it's terrifying reality. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, got back home. My dad is a doctor. He went and did rounds at the hospital that night. He was coming back a little later. I uh, opened the computer. Is supposed to be downloading. Probably should have been done at that point. Well, the download stopped, you know, and so I'm kind of chuckling, you know, to myself. Well, I can't get it to to start again. I, I'm pretty good with computers. Internet's on in the other computers in the house. It's only this one uh, that doesn't have internet. I texted my dad. I think I broke your computer. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll take a look when I get home. He gets home at like 10 p.m. that night. Um, and uh, I'm still not sure that this is a real uh, button that's programmed into uh, uh, Windows, but he right-clicked on network, and it said restore connection, and he clicked uh, restore connection. I, I don't believe that that's a, a real menu option in Windows. I've never seen it before. I'm A-plus certified. I'm certified in computer repair. I'm pretty good uh, <laughs> at computers. Yeah, you would know. So, <laughs> Maybe I mean I you know I On leave that level. one up. I, I don't I don't uh, you know I don't know that that's a Vatican approved miracle, but but it's uh, <laughs> but it's definitely a funny one to me. And download immediately starts as soon as he hits that button. But now it's going to be um, not till the next morning that the download's finished. Um, and so I go to bed that night. And I woke up at uh, like 4 a.m. I was always the kid that was awake way too early on Christmas morning. Uh, so I wrap myself in a blanket, 25 year old man, like giddy on Christmas morning. <laughs> it's been months of this, right? right? Go downstairs and I had this moment on the stairs as I descended to the, the living room where the laptop was. And I could see the Christmas tree and the Christmas lights. And like I paused on the stairs and like the feeling I got was so overwhelmingly Christmassy hmm. and knowing that like all these hilarious breakdowns of technology had led to this exact time, uh, yeah. I, was, I was like dumbstruck in some sense or awestruck 
um, of like, you know, okay, God's real and he's somehow connected to Christmas. Uh, so in some way, Christ is connected to God. Um, and that was that was my Christmas miracle, my epiphany on the on the stairs. Wow. And uh, I continued to uh, descend the stairs after a pause and this overwhelming uh, realization that God existed and was shortly thereafter uh, hunting womp rats in Beggar's Canyon uh, <laughs> inside the uh, <laughs> inside the Star Wars universe. Um, uh, so since, yeah. since you know so much about Star Wars then, being kind of a self-proclaimed nerd, uh -huh. I guess I have to ask you, yeah. I'm sure you know the internal temperature of a Tauntaun, right? I don't think I know the, uh, I don't think I read that section of the Star Wars Encyclopedia. It's, it's lukewarm. It's oh, lukewarm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just I, guessed it. I knew. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that prior. That's the first time I've ever guessed a, a dad joke. I haven't even heard that That's joke awesome. before. <laughs> I was, That's so awesome. Bad. I was like, I was... I'm so nerdy that I was going back through the Star Wars and like, there actually like, no, there might actually be. Is. Yeah, uh, it's 43 degrees Celsius. But then you, you didn't realize it was Isaac Fox. Exactly. And right. Anytime had Isaac to starts yeah. this, I just want to hide under the table for the rest of the episode. <laughs> oh it's too bad gosh. I'm the one being interviewed. Well, Brian, like with that miracle, I mean, I guess that started you. Uh, yeah. Back so to knowing that we're, you know, sort of coming to the end of this episode. Right. So I, th I think I can in brief get me uh, back to the to the church. Um, so that that week, um, uh, I went to uh, my godmother's house. Uh, we always stayed the night at her house before I would fly out of Columbus. Um, so this is going to another town and spending the night with my godmother. That day, she gave me as a Christmas gift a book of writings from C.S. Lewis, like hmm. a, a collection of his uh, of his writings. Um, went to the Columbus airport. There was uh, a hilarious uh, breakdown of events. I missed my flight um, and uh, and all this stuff. Well, I was super mad at God. Oh, let me say before, the night I stayed at my godmother's house, I had a dream that God and the devil were fighting over my soul. And wow. uh, and it was one of the. It was again one of those dreams that I think back to Sweden, like so visceral and real that I woke up, you know, sweating and thinking, "Well, that was real." Um, well, so I was yelling at God in the airport. Uh, you know, the day I start believing, or the week I start believing in you, you do this to me, me, Brian K. <laughs> right, like, uh, so do you know who something? I am? Right, right. <laughs> I've, I've believed in you now. Like uh, you owe me. <laughs> um, yeah, right. uh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm yelling, and it get, end up it, it works out that I get to an airport closer to my house earlier than I was supposed to land, and I'm reading this book on oh, and with a five hundred dollar voucher for another flight as well. Is that dark uh, universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. But I read that book on the flight home, and every word that C.S. Lewis wrote, and that that editor, whoever he was, collected into this collection so, of writing. So this wasn't like... Is speaking to, like, just spears into my heart. Every single line Gosh. is, like, everything I've experienced over the last, you know, six years or whatever. So this wasn't, like, mere Christianity or something. It was, like, a collection of quotes yeah. or... Yeah, so it's, like, a little reflection on suffering. It's, gotcha. um, it's a, it's a, it's a excerpt from The Silver Chair uh, and Jill talking... Uh, about Aslan and well, I don't know Lucy. Lucy, is he safe? Ta asking Mr. Be Beaver, uh, is is Aslan safe? Safe? Who said anything about safe? No, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's um, not a tame lion. <laughs> he's not a tame lion, exactly. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I landed in Burbank again on time early or earlier money in my pocket and I wrote in my phone in my notes Jesus is real wow. um, and because I didn't I was afraid I would forget um, <laughs> hey, that's I was afraid thing. like I, like that memory would like become like one of those things that's sort of lost to the past where it's like well maybe I was hallucinating uh, or maybe I was on drugs or which I wasn't but anyway um, Right. So I came back convicted, and I'm not actually going to be able to get us to the church in the time that we have. But no, and that's after totally that, fine. I pursued Christianity, and I spent two years doing research. And, and there's some more providence that I think is fun and interesting. And, and it eventually leads say. you to the church, but Brian, this is the conversion story of a lifetime. And you've been working for 10 years, and God continues to work this story out. I mean, I have a story, Eric and Isaac has a story. 
And it takes a long time to make sense of it enough to share it. And I think everyone can appreciate that at home, especially that, that those stories that we don't think matter, God knows exactly mm. uh, what he's doing. And if we can trust in that, I think that's what, that's all he wants. And it, your conversion never ends. Sure. It's deeper and deeper and deeper. So we'll definitely have another episode. <laughs> well, this is fun with too Brian. to do it in this context with friends who know yeah. me and yeah. like, but to hear your questions and your, you know, reflections brings it to, to life in a whole different way. You know, if I was just talking to the camera, you know, it, it might be a different amount of time, but I don't think it would be as rich. And, it, right. and it, it's it's a grace for me to hear it reflected back at me and, and hear the lessons I've learned be gifts for others. You know? That's because our stories are not done in a vacuum. They're with yeah. one another in relationship. And so. they're all in the story of salvation, you know, this grand story that God is, uh, you know, bringing to fruition over space and time. Uh, and we get to play that little part. Uh, it's just so You're good. You're speaking my <laughs> language in my heart, Brian Kane. Praise God for you and praise God for all of you guys. Uh, it's a gift to be here and uh, we thank you all for being with us. We're looking forward to the great adventure uh, in uh, all the future guests and stories that we have to share on Spirit and Spire here in the Archdiocese of Louisville. So God bless you all and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.